as a senior DevOps, been here for like four months. Hey. Um, and yeah, I learned a lot about Kubernetes in my time here. Thanks, Vincent, for that. I also learned a lot about Elasticsearch and how to run it on Kubernetes. Um, so yeah, I thought I'm going to share that experience uh, with you guys tonight. Um, um, yeah, so let's jump right in once we have a picture. OK. Um, so just a bit of a disclaimer. We're not going to talk about much about what Elasticsearch is. Um, because this is not an application level talk, this is more an infrastructure level talk. So we're going to talk about how to run Elasticsearch on Kubernetes. Um, just uh, who's, who in this room already has used Elasticsearch or is running Elasticsearch? Okay, that's about half, I guess. Who's running it on Kubernetes? Okay, so you guys can scrutinize me after the talk, please. Um, so just, um, yeah, I said I'm not going to talk about what Elasticsearch is. I'm just going to give a quick quote from Wikipedia. Um, it's a distributed full text search engine with an HTTP web interface, schema free JSON documents. It's based on the scene. So what can we take out of this? Uh, first, it's distributed. That's important. Uh, second, it's based on Lucene, which means it's based on Java, which is important on the infrastructure side. Um, it's got JSON documents and it's got a web interface, so it's got a REST API. Uh, so I guess that's pretty much the most important thing we have to know about it uh, since we need to run it. Uh, what are we using it for at Elasticsearch? Uh, surprisingly, we're using it as backend to power our search feature. Uh, we're not using this for logs, log analysis. We're using it really as a search system. Um, it's which makes it a pretty critical part of our setup. So basically, if if Elasticsearch is down, everything is down in ONSP. It's quite critical for us. Um, yeah, but to start, so we're running we're running our product index. I mean, I guess you know what ONSP is doing. Does anybody not know what we're doing? Okay, uh, we're everybody delivering. Knows. Nobody knows. Nobody I guess yeah. I guess everybody knows. Uh, that's great. So we're delivering groceries uh, and food, and that means we have a lot of products. And our product index, in the index is about 3 million documents uh, at the time of our speaking. We're getting about 15 to 20k queries per hour into our cluster. Um, latency is about 30 milliseconds, so I guess it's pretty fast. Uh, we're running a bit of an older version of Elasticsearch, uh, which is mostly due to our backend not being able to support anything better. At this point, we're working on it. Um, there's a quite bit of work on refactoring on it, it uh, but yeah, so far we're stuck on 2.3, even though we're also running 5.3 for some other services, so we're a bit on a microservice side of things, so some services are using a newer version of Elasticsearch. <coughs> Our Kubernetes clusters are 1.5, 1.7, uh, production is still 1.5 in the process of being upgraded to 1.7. Uh, staging is already 1.7, so we got most of the experience we get actually from both clusters, from both versions. So most of what I'm saying actually applies to all these versions. So it's pretty universal. A couple of concepts of Elasticsearch. I guess I have to talk about this a bit uh, just to set the context for the rest of the talk. Um, there's something called a cluster. Cluster is a bit of an overloaded thing in this talk. Uh, there's the Kubernetes cluster and there's the Elasticsearch cluster. Uh, for now, when I'm talking about cluster, I'm going to talk about Elasticsearch clusters. Uh, clusters consists of nodes, same problem, so I'm going to talk about Elasticsearch nodes predominantly. Um, yeah, a cluster is a collection of nodes. Uh, a node is an instance of Elasticsearch taking part in indexing and search. Um, you can have a cluster that consists only of a single node. Um, on these nodes, we have indices which can be aliased, uh, and an index is a collection of documents. It's pretty much like your average NoSQL database, even though Elasticsearch is not a NoSQL database, but yeah. Uh, an index is a collection of documents that are kind of somewhat similar. So for instance, all the products are in one index. Um, 
document is a piece of data expressed as JSON. Um, and the whole thing is broken down into shards. Each shard is a, each shard is basically a Lucene index in itself. It's a lot of things. So that charting is on level of Elasticsearch, not on Lucene level. Um, and charts are there for, and that's on the next slide, charts are basically there for ensuring scalability, uh, availability. Um, one thing you have to keep in mind if you design your cluster, you cannot change the shards. Once you have an index, you say, okay, I have five shards on my index. You can't change that later. It's, it's not possible, so you have to plan a bit ahead. But there's, again, I'm not going to talk much about that kind of stuff because that's application design. Uh, there is a lot of documentation on the Elasticsearch website. It's pretty good. Um, yeah, so you have nodes, you have shards. So that's your index. It's broken down into five pieces. Um, obvious problem is what if one of these nodes dies? That shard is gone, which means your index is gone. How do you help with that? That's what we have replication for. Uh, so basically what Elasticsearch is going to try, we, we say, okay, we have... Our index has whatever. Okay, these are four shards, actually, not three. Um, our index has four shards. We are going to have one replica. That means there's going to be eight shards in total. Each shard has a copy. And Elasticsearch um, will be trying its best to allocate these shards to different nodes to make sure that no two shards of this, no, no two replicas of the same shard on the same node. So if any of these nodes goes down, we always have enough copies to restore the cluster. Um, one thing is also important to know is that you can search into the primary shards and into the replicas. So queries can hit every one of these shards. So you basically get eight shards, eight active shards. Um, um, yeah, nodes in Elasticsearch have roles. Also quite important if you plan a deployment. Uh, they can be specialized and should be specialized uh, in anything but your local testing setup. Um, there is a master which does discovery, so the master basically knows all the other nodes. Um, it does shard allocation, it creates indices. There can be only one master at a time. Also quite important to know later. Um, they are elected, so with the usual problems of election. Um, then you have the data nodes. These are the nodes that I actually do. They have a lifting. They contain the actual shards. Um, they do the search, the indexing, um, anything. And then you have clients which provide the REST API. And since each index can be distributed over all the data nodes, um, the client nodes also have quite a bit of lifting to do. They have to do the aggregation of the data. So they basically pull all your documents from your data nodes and aggregate that. So it's not just some glorified thin REST client. It's actually also something that does quite a bit of work. Um, important when you're planning resources. Um, yeah, which, which kind of node is what is basically controlled in Elasticsearch YAML. Uh, as I said, each node can have multiple roles, so you can have one role that does all of these things, which is what you want to have in a multi if you have a single node cluster. But if you go into production, it's better to specialize your, your nodes. It looks pretty much like this. So this would be the configuration of a data node. Um, it's not a master. It doesn't do ingestion. It doesn't do remote search. So it's just holding the data. And depending on how you set these flags, these nodes have different configurations. Okay, any questions so far? That was the general part about Elasticsearch. What is the advantages to use Elasticsearch in Cube Cluster? Sorry? What would be the advantage to use Elasticsearch in Cube? I think we'll cover it. Yeah, just well, the so far this was just the general thing. Just, just first talk about what is Elasticsearch. If you have any questions about that, then we'll do it on Kubernetes and explain the advantages. Um, any other questions? <laughs> Why did you use your Elasticsearch as a as the index and not a, a proper NoSQL database? Even it's, I mean, we're using our primary database is Postgres, right? Mm. So the, the system is backed by RDS. Um, so we're using Elasticsearch just for the search part. There's a um, basically our backend is using some gem which is called. How was search kick search kick gem doing all that indexing? So everything that goes into the database is also piped into into Elasticsearch. Um, yeah, so yeah, we 
decided, for whatever reason, to use Kubernetes on Elasticsearch. That was um, before his time. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's the other thing. I mean, this, I, I kind of inherited that thing, so I wasn't part of the reasoning. I think Vincent's going to be able to give more insight in that. Um, anyway, so if we want to deploy that into Kubernetes, um, we're going to have these three types of nodes. We have a deployment for each of these nodes. Uh, we're going to need a couple of services. So basically, you need two services in the simplest configuration. You need one service, which is just a client IP service, which is not exposed, which keeps your masters together, uh, serves as a discovery for the cluster. Um, and you have your API, which is obviously exposed at some point outside of the cluster. So it's either a node port or in our setup, it's an ingress. Um, I suppose you're all familiar with these Kubernetes terms. Okay. Uh, we're using Helm to deploy it. Uh, there are other ways, but that's what we chose to do. Uh, I'm not gonna, we're not sharing our own Helm chart, but there is a Helm chart in Kubernetes charts, um, which you can have a look at and adopt for your own setup if you want. Uh, okay, so just um, why one deployment per node role? Um, basically because of scaling. So you want to be able to scale them independently. Uh, for instance, for masters, there's, there's no point in having more than three masters because only one can, act, can be active at a time. So you want to have an odd number of masters because you, want to, you need to do election. You cannot have only one master because if that's down, there's no master. So there's three masters. That's it. Uh, you want to have more than three data nodes to properly distribute the, distribute the indices. I mean, at least three data nodes to ensure proper distribution of your indices. Uh, of your shards. Clients is needed, so I don't know, start at free, see how long you, how far you can go with that and scale them up as needed. Um, you need, yeah, you need a discovery plugin for Kubernetes. So basically, the way discovery is done in Elasticsearch is pluggable. Um, and there is a specific plugin for, plugin for Kubernetes. Uh, the image we're using, the Docker image we're using has everything built in already. I think it's, yeah, here's the link to that plugin. So basically, essentially it's a Docker image, base image, base image is Elasticsearch, it installs that plugin. Uh, and that's it. It's not very complicated. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Okay. I'm going to get there. Um, yeah, services, again, you need a discovery service, you need an API server. And if you use STS, uh, this um, preview, stateful set, you need another service for that stateful set. Uh, and Again, optional, you can have an ingress, you can have a config map. We're using cron jobs for something, for snapshots. Um, yeah. Service accounts. Ah, yeah, oh, yeah. That's, a, that's quite important. You need a service account. If, if you have RBAC enabled on your cluster, you need to have a service account that is configured to be able to use the Kubernetes API. That's 1.7, right? 1.7. 1, 1 so that's, that's one of the pitfalls we stumbled upon when we upgraded from 1.5 into 1.7 all of a sudden it stopped working. The discovery stopped working because we had our back on a new cluster. Uh, there are guys that have the keys need rolling, then everything will break. Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's, when we started, um, we say, okay, let's do this stateless because Elasticsearch is awesome. Elasticsearch can recover, right? If a node goes down, the index goes down, it's automatically going to redistribute the shards. It's going to recover. So if we lose a node, no problem. Elasticsearch is going to handle it for us. Um, so, yeah. And that's what we're still running in production, by the way. And it works, actually. So it works, it works pretty well. As long as you have enough data nodes and you have enough hosts in your Kubernetes cluster, it's not actually, actually a big problem. So you you're, just running, so effectively you're just running this on empty desks. You Empty there's yeah. And you I have some sort of snapshotting to S3. Uh, hang on, hang on, I'm going to get that. So I'm not doing it like that anymore. The part part of the reasoning is that this is not data we can we cannot afford to lose. It's it's the copy it's a copy of the production data. There is a rake task in the backend that can basically re-index the whole thing. It takes six hours. So that <laughs> there's there's this, there's a downtime involved. But it's possible, so we said, okay, let's go for it, let's try it. And again, it, it, it works. So we didn't have a lot of downtimes 
I think we added on him once in like two oh, years. Initially we had. <laughs> well, Do I was. Use that storage or you store the shards on the. That's that's container. that's exactly the point. So far, it's using empty there. So it's it's basically stored on the host, but that doesn't matter. Oh, okay. Um, so no persistent storage, almost storage. I'm I'm not. So not we, we're gonna we're gonna get there. Okay. This is this is the start. This is the original setup. Right, okay. That's, the that's what he uh, added. Yeah. Um, right. So I mean, the problems are obvious, right? So you can afford to lose one. No, you can probably afford to lose two if you're lucky. Uh, if you're lucky, uh, but what if multiple node goes down? Uh, what if you want to upgrade your cluster? I mean, if you want to upgrade your cluster, you need to roll over, and Elasticsearch isn't going to be able to recover the shards fast enough for large indices as Kubernetes is going to roll them over. So Kubernetes doesn't know about your indices, right? You don't have to roll your for a cluster upgrade at all. Sorry. You don't have to roll your you don't have to roll your containers for a cluster upgrade at all. If you're doing that, then someone's doing your cluster upgrades wrong. Which cluster? Elasticsearch or Kubernetes? Oh, no, Kubernetes. Kubernetes. I'm, ta I'm talking about Elasticsearch. Oh, yeah. I'm talking about updating the deployment. But Elasticsearch also has this concept of the replications. How many shards? How many times do you want to replicate your shards if you put like yeah, yeah, scale right. of three? So basically, it's, you have three copies, so it's giving you flexibility. It's it's possible. You can you can do it. I mean, there's a way to do an upgrade. I'm going to get there. Uh, it's just not exactly easy. I mean, in the end, this whole thing looks like this, right? <laughs> I, you're right. It's, it's not a thing you should be doing. Um, so one thing is, somebody mentioned it, we have snapshots uh, that mitigated the whole thing a bit, mitigates the risk a bit. Um, it's, it's a feature built into Elasticsearch. It's accessible via the API. It can be used, uh, basically takes your entire index, writes it into a, some kind of persistent storage, uh, local file system, S3, HDFS, Azure, GCS. This is what's supported by now by means of some plugins, so you need to actually install a plugin into your Elasticsearch cluster to make use of these repositories. Um, yeah, if you, co if you combine that with cron jobs in Elasticsearch and, and in Kubernetes, that works actually pretty well. Um, yeah, we have our own custom tool for that. We have like a Python wrapper that wraps around the Kubernetes API and can be used as a command on Kubernetes, uh, so you can run that as a job. One thing you can also do with that, which is a pretty interesting feature, is you can replicate your cluster. So you can say, okay, I take my production cluster and replicate that into staging. As long as both Elastic searches are roughly the same version, there's actually a compatibility table on the website uh, that actually works. Um, obviously, you still have a data loss window, so you need to look at your RPOs, uh, how far, how much loss of data, what time interval you can afford for the data loss if something goes wrong. Um, we also tried to use that with Helm hooks, so we tried, okay, let's just take a snapshot before we do an upgrade with Helm, uh, but that caused Helm to time out because you had to wait for the snapshot to complete. Uh, so that was not a great idea. But it's possible, so if you want. Um, so how do we do manual upgrade on our stateless clusters? Uh, basically, we start another cluster and roll the data into the new cluster. And then we upgrade, we replace the old cluster and. Yeah, then we're done. But you have to do that one by one, so it takes a bit of time. It's usually like it takes one hour or so something, because you really have to shut down every single node at a time and wait until the cluster recovers, which takes 10 to 15 minutes. Do that for four or five nodes. It's going to take you an hour or two. Uh, so that's a lot of YouTube videos. Um, <laughs> one thing you have to take care of, you have to, I mean, it's, it's not a big deal if you use a Helm chart, you basically need to, you need to make sure that both clusters are attached to the same discovery service, which is not a big problem. Um, and then basically, yeah, you have one Helm deployment, that is your active cluster, you start another Helm deployment, which joins your existing cluster, then you can start rolling over. Um, so this is what we're doing in production, unless, until we can finally go for this, uh, and this is what is really required if you want to use Elasticsearch and sleep well on Kubernetes. Um, essentially, I don't know, stateful sets, everybody's familiar with that, right? Uh, so I'm just going to quickly run through that. Um, it's the Kubernetes approach to a stateful application. Uh, if, if you want to run a database in Kubernetes, you better use stateful sets. It's quite similar to deployment. It really doesn't look that much different. It's got some extra properties. Uh, first of all, pods have a defined order, which is quite important when we come to persistent. The naming pattern is a bit different. We're going to see that in a minute. So it's not just random characters. They're actually sequentially named. 
um, they will always be launched and terminated in sequence. So they will always come up 0, 1, 2, 3, and then it comes down 4, 3, 2, 1. Um, there are a couple of other things, so <laughs> check the documentation. Um, and they have PVC templates, and this is the persistence part. Um, so how does that look in practice? If you think about our stateless deployment, we had a deployment here for the data. Now we have an STS, which has basically a PV persistent volume attached to every single data node. Uh, and basically when we scale that thing up, it's going to automatically allocate a new PVC for us. Uh, yeah. Um, then for some reason I haven't quite understood yet, to be, to be honest, uh, you need to have a headless service attached to that STS, which is kind of to ensure the network identity of the pods, whatever that means. But yeah, well, you need to have it. Um, yeah, I, he I heard that question somewhere from someone. Why not just use PVCs in a deployment? I mean, you get like pods, you attach, attach the volume to every pod in that deployment and you're done, right? You have persistence. Doesn't work. Why? Because pods in a deployment are not related to each other. So they're just random, right? So if you have a pod, it comes up, it gets terminated, you get a new pod, that pod has no, has no history with the previous pod. Um, there's no identity that is maintained across restarts, which means while you can technically attach a PVC to each pod, uh, how to do that in multiple pods? You cannot say, at least in a deployment, you cannot say I want to have a PVC for each of my pods. You can only say, okay, I want to have three pods and three PVCs and somehow manually attach them. Uh, so how do you maintain that and how do you, for instance, when your pod gets rescheduled, when, it's get, when it gets kicked off the node and the pod is going to be restarted on another node, and another Kubernetes host, uh, how does the PV, the volume, follow that part? Uh, while in a stateful set, and that's why they are ordered and why that is important, they maintain their identity. So if pod number one goes down, pod number one comes back, and the PVC is also number one, so Kubernetes can basically keep track which PVC belongs to which pod and can reattach them, <coughs> which is done by something called a volume claim template. So that basically defines a volume for each pod in the state for set, which interestingly even survives the Helm delete purge. So even if you delete your entire deployment, your entire Helm release, uh, your PVCs will still be there. And when you bring it back up, it's Sorry. Right. Who's familiar with Helm? Oh. Yeah. Is anyone not familiar with Helm? Yeah. Pretty much everyone. Everybody <laughs> else is sleeping. Um, Okay, Helm is, Helm is a package manager for Kubernetes. Um, in the context of this talk, think about templates for Kubernetes manifests. Uh, basically, Kubernetes manifests plus Go template or handlebars, if you want to, if you're not familiar with Kubernetes. There's Go a lot of projects that uh, template manifests, but Helm is, uh, takes it to a level where you do an, like you really not only think of it like just templating for your manifest, but also managing your installations, your releases, rolling back, rolling forward. Uh, yeah. So, quick question about Helm. So, what's the limitation of the publicly available Elasticsearch chart, which you know, kind of uh, why are you rolling your own? I think when we started, there was no publicly available chart, so we built our own and then kept sticking with it because it's like, okay, we have this thing deployed and it's easier to make incremental changes than to replace the entire thing. Did we, uh, we never like merge upstream back into ours? No. Okay. Maybe it was merged initially, but I, yeah. I, uh, maybe it was forked initially, I don't know. We have our, basic, we have our, we have our own repository of hand charts. Right. Uh, where we also keep some so kind of proprietary oh. stuff, so it's nothing we... Yeah, to clarify, a chart is basically a package. Um, so if you do apt-get install um, Elasticsearch, uh, Helm is the same thing, Helm install Elasticsearch. It will, if you do it on a, on a Linux machine, you're, it's going to set up Java, it's going to set up the whole thing, set up your configuration directory, make sure that there's an init class that whenever your computer starts, uh, Elasticsearch starts as well, all, the, all of that. Helm is doing the same thing, but for a cluster of machines, so for communities. Right. I'm going to show you a bit of our Helm chart later. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm going to give a little bit of context, I guess, when we get there. But how does this set up? Is it a separate cluster only for Elastic, or is it a more general cluster that you also run Elastic? I mean, how, how is it going to set up? 
Yeah, we are trying to, I mean, one of the, the uh, attractions to Kubernetes is to share workload, right, to share clusters. Uh, we separate based on namespace. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are using the same clusters, but we separate um, the different deployments based on namespaces. So uh, deployments are constricted by namespace. So the pods running per host, because Elastic is pretty much consuming all of the memory. <laughs> yeah, you could, you could, you, you could use yeah, node. We could use node affinity. I mean, we had, we had a bit of, we had to do a bit of tweaking recently yeah. to get. Uh, when we set up a new Kubernetes cluster, then it started run out, running out of memory in one of the. I can talk about that. Also. Obviously, yeah. I guess so Vincent is going to get there. But do you right. have something around Helm still that handles the configuration of the config management? There, we're using fabric. For the, the Fabric 8 clustering that that uses the Kubernetes API to find the other nodes and create a cluster, right? That's one of the reasons. We no, you're talking about Helm, right? I mean, I run, with Helm, you still have to give some parameters to. Oh, you know, okay. I Helm guess. I mean, I. I itself, so do you, do you have something okay. to manage that? To answer your question, no. I mean, we just keep the values filed somewhere, right? Along with the with the deployments, or for other microservices, we're using we're using Drone, uh, Drone Helm plugin, where we basically put that into the Drone YAML file. Yeah, so our CI system. That was the same question you raised when you joined on Onusby, basically. It's like, how do I manage the different Elasticsearch deployments, right? And you're using, um, in the git commit, the values. Uh, but the values are no secrets, right? It's just configuration for right. deployment. Right. And it's also Vault is used for, actually called Vault is used for keeping Yeah, secrets. anything that's a secret is, is not there. And, um, so we are looking, there are solutions, like um, there's a value store plugin for um, for Helm, which I've been advocating, but I have not implemented it yet. <laughs> so um, that's that would be a centralized index. It's actually built based on DynamoDB, so you get like a central index of all your deployments across all of your clusters, all of the values, all of the parameters. And that's, um, I feel like, the way forward. Um, but at the moment, the Git, actually, I mean, committing some values to Git uh, gives you also an audit, gives you also a diff, gives you also some control. Um, so that's that's solution. Right. But then again, I mean, somebody could make a talk about Helm config management, right? Yeah. Sorry, just stopping. So it's it's uh, focus. Let's let's keep let's go back to last session. Um, okay, I'm probably going to show you that in the real show you the real thing instead. Um, so this is our, <laughs> so th this is a Helm chart. So that's why I say it's basically Kubernetes manifest plus handlebars uh, in the most practical level. That's not handlebars though, that's code template, but I guess handlebars is more, more known. Um, yeah. Do you have an example of the values file? Oh, sorry? Do you have an example of the values file just to Yeah, yeah, to show here's my, the values here. That's what you mean, right? So basically, Okay, the, the structure of this Helm chart is, can I close this thing? Yeah, so we get a bit more space here. Uh, so this, this, is, this is a Helm chart. It basically contains a couple of metadata files. There's this chart YAML file, which contains like the version and stuff like that. Uh, there's a readme. There are these values files. So this, this is, these are my default values. And then you have your templates, which are templated Kubernetes manifests and all these placeholders are going to be replaced with the values. And then I can, for specific deployments, I can just override specific values. So I can say, okay, this is, this is my default values file. It's always called values YAML. All the defaults are in here. And then for specific deployments, I create a uh, values file that basically gets merged into the default values file. And it can override certain things like, for instance, I want to Override the host name for my ingress. Uh, I want to use a different ingress controller than the default one. And yeah, that's basically your rendered Kubernetes manifest then. And Helm is basically going to take all these YAML files, all these manifests, everything that's in the template directory, and run kubectl apply on that on a very simple level. Um, so let's just look at the, that's why the structure is very similar. So, so just ignore the placeholders. Just, just think of this as a manifest with a fancy syntax. Uh, so you have a stateful set, it has a spec, it um, has replicas all like a deployment. Um, 
This is new, pod management policy, the default is serial. So basically if you set it serial, it's going to start each pod at a time, which can take a bit of time. For certain applications that might be important for Elasticsearch is not, so we can just fire up all the pods, all the data pods at the same time, no problem. Um, update strategy, by default it's actually not doing any updates, you have to delete the pods manually. Uh, we override that, set that to rolling update for Elasticsearch because we're lazy. Um, okay, what is this? Okay, this is just metadata. Affinity, anti-affinity is quite important. As you can imagine, you don't want to have all your data pods on the same host. Uh, so you want to make sure it's only one per host. Um, <coughs> this is the service account name. I say, I told, as I said, we have to create a separate service account for Elasticsearch, which has more permissions than our default service, service account. Uh, and then, yeah, here's your container, um, which is just, this is how we set our roles. Um, essentially, we can, we can use environment variables to override config file settings. So we say, okay, this is, this is a data node, right? So we said, ma this is master node is false, data node is true. You don't and use config maps? We use config maps, but I can show you the config map. The problem with config maps is that config maps are only mounted into the container immutably when a pod starts. So if you want to change a configuration and you change the config map, you then have to go and delete the pod for it to pull in the new config map. Mm. Whereas if you change an environmental variable when you go kubectl apply, it will automatically roll your pods for you. Okay, but uh, with Helm you can also make annotations that take checksums of the files and automatically force rolling updates. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, yeah. that's control yeah. Um, but the reason why we're using, okay, the Elasticsearch configuration, this is something that works on application level, this is not a, not a feature of communities or Helm. Uh, it takes these placeholders in the config file and replaces them with environment variables. Uh, and the reason why we still have that is because originally we didn't even have a custom config file, we just used the default one, which is for the basic use case, it does everything you need. You can customize whatever you need to customize with these placeholders. Uh, we only had to introduce our own config map uh, when we disabled script, when we started enabling scripting, which is something I'm going to get to in the end of the talk. Um, okay, I'm going to talk a bit about the configuration later. Um, this is something you want to have an eye on ES Java Ops. This is obviously, um, you need to be careful how you set your Java memory in relation to your memory limits, because that can be a big surprise. Bad surprise if you do that wrong. Access keys for AWS are for the snapshots. So <coughs> this is basically for allowing the Elasticsearch cluster to write snapshots into S3. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to show you the keys. They're involved. Um, <coughs> memory requests, uh, ports, volume mounts. Ah, yeah, and here, this is, here are the volume mounts, right? So as you see here, this, this basically refers to a PVC. Uh, this is the persistent volume claim. Um, there's also, so this is the config map mounted in the config direction directory. Uh, now you want to have a readiness probe, um, and here are the volumes. So this is, this is the volume for the config map itself. So this is just a straightforward config map, but this is the volume claim template. And that basically creates a volume PVC for every, no, every node, every pod that comes up. And then it's mounted as a volume mounted to the container, straightforward. A uh, couple of things you want to set on your volume plans, but that, that's just a PVC again, persistent volume claim. Um, so you have access mode, read, write, runs, obviously, so it can be mounted only to one part at a time. It's not you can only write once, you can actually just, the one stands for one part. Um, storage class name, whatever your <coughs> cloud infrastructure provider is, um, and then how much storage you want to have, depending on your indices, obviously. Okay, so this is our stateful set. Yeah, resource limit, I mentioned it. Um, I just did that last week on a staging cluster. I messed up, I said, I gave him too much JVM. I gave the JVM too much memory. And what Java does when it starts up, it takes this value, XMX. Now XMS is the memory at the start and allocates that right away. So you have a huge chunk of memory and if that memory is more than your memory limit, your pod crashes. Uh, and you also need to make sure that your, that your operating system also has a bit of memory left. Uh, you shouldn't use swapping, I think. I mean, I think you should know that. Don't swap. 
because it's going to be very bad for performance. Uh, so you have to live with memory, with physical memory. Um, on data nodes, you should only allocate about 50% of the available memory as heap space. Uh, the other 50% are going to be used for the OS. And Lucene is also going to cache stuff itself outside of the, of the heap space. Uh, and your masters and clients, since they hold no data, they don't need that much cache, so you can just use about 75% of your available memory as the heap. Um, the recommendation from Elasticsearch is to just use XMX, XMS at the same value. So if you say, I'm going to set a limit, a maximum amount of 4 gigabyte for my J JVM, then you can also just as well start with that amount, because Elasticsearch is going to fill it up. You're going to see that in your monitoring. So it's usually utilized about 99% of the heap spaces used by Elasticsearch right away. I uh, another thing. I mean, Elasticsearch is smart enough to to allocate your shards across your nodes, so you don't have two shards of the same index on the same node. Uh, but it doesn't know about Kubernetes hosts. So what if our host goes down? So what if this? What if what if? Yeah, what if the first one goes down, 1021 goes down, then you lose, if you're unlucky, you lose one index because the two shard, the two replicas for that index might be just on those two uh, data nodes. So what you want to make sure is that you have each of these data pods is on its own node, on its own host, uh, which Kubernetes does by default, as we observed, but yeah, why take chances? So what you want to do is you want to set up anti-affinity, which basically makes so and anti-affinity is uh, or affinity in general is a new is a pretty predecessor no successor to node selectors. So yeah. node selectors are going to be deprecated. You're supposed to use affinity. You can do node affinity, which doesn't help as much here uh, because what we want to say is don't sc don't schedule a data pod on a node that already has a data pod data pod on it. So. It's basically pod affinity or pod anti-affinity in this case. Uh, how do you configure that? Uh, you say there are basically two levels. You can say required during scheduling, ignoring, ignored during execution, and I think requested or preferred during scheduling, ignored during execution. That's a lot of letters for saying soft and hard limits. Um, there's this thing called topology key, which basically means on which level of infrastructure. So you want to have it in the same availability zone, you want to have it on the same host, you want to have it on the same whatever. So straightforward, we just say, okay, we don't want to have two of these pods on the same node. Um, and then we need to say, okay, by what condition do we select nodes that we want, don't want to have on the same node, right? So we say, in this case, it's straightforward. Our Data pods are tagged with whatever <coughs> app, ES demo, Elasticsearch, and draw data. And we don't want to have another pod with the same labels on the same node. Relatively simple. So maybe I can just try to give you a quick demo. Um, so let's say we have this is just a demo cluster, so it has for data nodes. Three master nodes. Sorry? You got three master nodes. Yeah, three master nodes and four actual nodes that can run stuff. Um, so this, these are our parts for Elasticsearch. So you see like there are three deploy there are two deployments, client and master. Uh, they are like as you would expect a pod from a deployment to be named with some random appendix, and then you see like these data, data pods are spe special. They are named by index. So they're always going to keep, they're going to keep these indices when they get restarted. They're not going to be renamed. Um, yeah, so we see we have four data pods, right? And we have four nodes. And if I have this um, anti affinity set up on my Pods. I can just okay, cube cuddle get STS. That's my stateful set. STS replicas. So now I say okay, I have four pods, and now I want to have a fifth one. Ah. Okay. Let's 
let's keep an eye on this. So you see it basically started the fifth data part and it's impending and it's never going to change that state unless I scale up the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, why is that? So describe part is the data for. It's going to say it's fairly scheduled because I have no nodes that match that anti affinity condition. There are no nodes that not already have a data pod on them. Now, this is, this is because I said required. I could also say preferred, which means it would still schedule that node somewhere. It would probably just put two data pods on some node. Um, but yeah, why take chances? <laughs> just, just keep it um, that way. Yeah, so again, it's, it's, it's just going to stay that way until kingdom come. So let's get it back down. Uh, okay, anti affinity. A couple of other things you want to tweak. Uh, you want to change your cluster name, even though I think I haven't ever tried it. Uh, if you run two Elasticsearch clusters with the same name in the same Kubernetes cluster, I think as long as you don't connect them to the same discovery service, it doesn't matter. Uh, but you still want to have that for your monitoring. So if you use, for instance, Datadoc as we do, uh, you need to use that cluster name to identify your cluster and to find your stuff. Uh, again, JVM, tweak that. Can't be done in the config file. It has to be done on uh, command line on as an environment variable. Um, that That's an interesting, node name is an interesting thing. Uh, we didn't do that in the start and always led to that. We had to kind of figure out where, which, which, um, which pod name Iron Man or Captain America or whatever related to because by default Elasticsearch names denotes by random Marvel characters. Uh, so that gives you a bit of a headache at 3 a.m. in the morning when your cluster is down. So um, uh, so just call yes. So now this this now if you basically set up your node name equals host name, it's basically name, name your node after the pod it's running on, which is a lot easier to identify uh, using the cat API. Uh, I'm gonna talk about these endpoints a bit later. Um, yeah, what you also want to do is you want to set your node counts. Uh, for instance, you want to tell Elasticsearch uh, how many masters you're going to expect, you're expecting to have. Otherwise, if two masters come up at the same time, they say, okay, I'm the master, I'm the master, and you have a split brain. So you need to tell Elasticsearch that it's got to have to wait until there are three masters before it's going to elect one of them as your master, as your active master. Um, it also can be used to say, okay, I want to have like and like two or three data nodes at least before I start recovering indices. So if you start up the cluster or if you restart it, it doesn't start thrashing your CPU or memory before everything is ready to keep the data. Um, monitoring, we're not going to endorse Datadog, but it's pretty cool. Um, basically, just point, last point, point uh, Datadog agent at your Elasticsearch URL and it's going to give you tons and tons and tons of metrics. It's really, really a lot of stuff. Um, if you're using Datadoc, there is a built-in Elasticsearch dashboard by default. I uh, can only recommend opening that and looking what kind of metrics that thing can track. It's pre pretty interesting. Um, so what we are looking at, uh, yeah, the way we configure it in, your new, in our newer clusters, we're using pod annotations. So you basically have annotations on your pod that tell Datadoc uh, to pick up metrics from that particular pod. Um, things that are important, obviously memory, 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 memory. Uh, look at it per pod, look at it per host to make sure that your hosts are not going to run out of memory. CPU is not that critical. So far we never had any issues with CPU. Might be because we never set any limits. But yeah, so you want to probably track your CPU limit, your CPU limit at some point to set a proper CPU limit for your Pods to make sure that the community cluster, community scheduler makes intelligent decisions. I think so far we noticed if you don't, and this is also something Kelsey clearly says. If, I don't know if anybody knows about Kelsey's high power and his presentation of uh, the community scheduler and how he compares it to like Tetris, like scheduling Tetris blocks. 
if you don't tell it what to expect, it basically doesn't use your cluster properly. So, and, and the same if you don't set CPU requests or limits, the scheduler is not going to optimize your resources. Right. I mean, we, we did start setting CPU limits by it just recently, actually. Um, basically, just observing all the CPU usage without limits and say, okay, what is this thing going to use over a week or a month? And then we set the limits accordingly. <coughs> I guess that's a way to make decisions. Uh, you also <coughs> want to look at many, how many healthy Kubernetes hosts you have, and if it's just to figure out why your cluster went from yellow overnight. Maybe it's just because some elastic, some, some EC2 host restarted, or some, like your core OS didn't update or whatever. So do you ever hit disk uh, your limits? No. So, I mean, so far we only hit memory limits. We did have some like uh, where the I.O. was going wild was if we have multiple data pods on the same node. And, uh, and, and you know, like when we were doing, um, like there was some node became unavailable and then pods are being rescheduled and they start to be co-located. And, and then we started to see huge problems, latency issues and all that. Uh, but mm -hmm. as, long, as, as long as we like provision them uh, properly and we set up all the anti-affinity properly and be and, and we only saw it so far as a symptom of something else going on. Uh, and then you also see other things. So you see network load, you see CPU load spiking, uh, memory. You have swap enabled on your nodes, your no. Kubernetes nodes. It's actually not Yeah, you yeah. don't do that for cloud. Did you try to run in the federated cluster? It's multiple Kubernetes cluster? Like active? active. I know we can have a whole discussion about that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, that's also a bit, I mean, that's a bit out of scope. I guess we want to have a talk about it better at some point in the future. Yeah, we should. Um, what you also want to look at is the ass metrics. So you don't need to worry about where you get your JVM metrics from. Elasticsearch is going to report them for you. Uh, you want to track your cluster state. Very important. If it's yellow, you're fine because you still have a chance of recovery. Yellow means one chart. So basically, you say, okay, you want to have two replicas of my indices, and he says, if you don't have enough replicas, this, uh, this cluster goes yellow. If you lose all replicas of one index, of one chart, um, then your cluster is red, and then you better have a backup. Yeah, your search queue size, it's an important, quite important metric to see, like, if you have a, normally it should be flat, you shouldn't have any queue. We don't have any queue normally. If it goes up, then you have a problem, then somehow the node is in trouble. Uh, storage size, obviously if you use PVCs you want to know how much of them are used. Um, yeah, and yes, will be a good test for your memory reserve. So if you want to have a reason to run elastic search on Kubernetes, that might be one. If you want to stress test it. And it's also going to test your cluster autoscaler. It's a good way to test your autoscaler. Maybe we miss some, some in here, so tell us what do we miss. <laughs> Maybe you want to highlight. How do you collect the metrics? Do you use file bits or? Uh, uh, Datadoc agent. Yeah. DD agent. Yeah. Datadoc agent. Yeah, we're paying for it. It's a. Uh, it's it's another. It's a demon set. There's a part running on each node doing the polling. What about triggering alerts based on this? Uh, is it integrated into Datadoc or? We're using VictorOps, but I'm not sure how the integration exactly works. Yeah, Maybe. so all of the Datadog uh, metrics are, can be plotted on charts, and you can set like alerts based on the metrics, and then you can integrate it with your uh, pager duty, whatever um, you manage for your own call duty. So all of that is like we. I initially we thought about running Prometheus and doing everything ourselves, but this is kind of very critical component, and we already tried to run too much, so. Datadog is, I mean, not saying that Datadog is the best solution, but <laughs> um, there are several good solutions out there uh, that help you with that. Right. So what's the, what was the improvement from going from a non-stateful set empty directory to using a stateful set with PVCs? What how long does it take to fail it? The most important thing is you can just up Helm upgrade on it and it's going to take down your data pods one by one, it's going to bring them back up and because it's all PVC, so it's the volume is back, the index is back. measuring the performance improvements mm -hmm. between the two of them? And how, much, how much was it? No, <laughs> I don't think we measured performance yeah, very latency. Like we, we don't have a compared, compared comparison scenario because the stateful one is staging and the stateless one is production so far. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So I mean, we want, we're going to upgrade production at some point in the future. I mean, one big thing was upgrading the Kubernetes cluster for production. That's part of the cluster with the boots. So that, that's one of the next things we're going to do, and then maybe we can give you some feedback mm -hmm. on how that performs in practice. Was there anybody else? Coming back to the first question, so what is the advantage to run Elastic in Kubernetes cluster? I think one thing is governance. You want to have everything in the same cloud if you want to have that. And as far as I know, you cannot run Elasticsearch in Singapore, in IWS. Oh, is you're, it? You're comparing to what? To, to using the, the like hosted solution of, of uh, AWS or to no, create, let's say creating very metal I'm setting up, putting all in the Kubernetes cluster, as you did, or I'm setting up just three nodes running outside the cluster and just feeding all the data from the cluster inside the Elastic. So. I mean, to have, I mean, okay, there's, yeah, right. So it depends on what you're comparing it to. I was comparing it to AWS Elastic. There's a hosted Elastic search, right? No, no, I'm just your own, your, on your own VMs. Obviously, obviously, you can just use your favorite configuration management and fire up your own cluster bare on, on, on EC2 instances. Not which is. Why so? run it on Kubernetes instead of. The thing is, instead of on, on VMs, that applies to any single any application. Right. I mean, our strategy is run everything on Kubernetes or as much as possible because it gives us more. Uh, we can focus on one thing, one piece of technology. We don't need to say, okay, now we need puppet or chef or Ansible to, to provision our Elasticsearch cluster next to our Kubernetes clusters. So we're going to use right. Helm and Terraform to fire up our infrastructure, and that's pretty much it. So this is this is where we want to get. I mean, you could say. Well, I was thinking. You know, spinning up a couple of extra data nodes is very fast if you have the sufficient Kubernetes nodes available. You just, uh, you, you just increase the number of replicas and they automatically join the cluster. But then you would still need to, I mean, that would just, we did that when we had like a, a performance issue, right? I mean, we had a huge performance issue and we really scaled right. out. Right. Um, but, but, I mean, you can still do the same if you have configuration management and you have more VMs. Uh, maybe you have a big image that can go also quite fast. So. Um, I don't know, it's just Kubernetes is like a uniform, unified way of doing it for everything. I think the benefit also is you can run other stuff on your cluster. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. So like rather than a dedicated yeah. elastic search cluster. Well, usually with elastic you don't run anything else. Yeah. But you said that you have well, to you can you set, set limits. You can use affinity, you can say, okay, I'm going to have the same Kubernetes cluster, but I have you know, an instance group that is dedicated for elastic search, and then you have elastic search only on these nodes. And everything else uh, runs on a separate set of nodes. That's so a, that's, that's a perfect. Like, we do that where we are. It's a perfectly valid, valid deployment mechanism. Like to deploy things which look like they'd be they'd be good enough for their own dedicated instance. But like, let's say you want to run an Elasticsearch node, and you know it needs 60 gigs of RAM. You know it needs eight cores, and you have a machine with 10 cores and 80 gigs of RAM. And there is someone your, there is somebody in your company that needs to run like 100 microservices, which is one millicore each or something. Then you're gonna you're gonna fill up those extra two cores. So it might, uh, if you're running hundreds of nodes or even tens of nodes, that the, the, the little extra bit that you're not using every now and then really kind of adds up. Right. That's the whole. I mean, that's one of the main. If you read the the paper about Borg, like they, they basically say the main, one of the main advantages is uh, to to run mixed workloads across your nodes. So you know, at different times of day, you might need different like batch jobs running at night. That can we use uh, resources that are available. Uh, if you during the day you need to scale out more um, stateful, I mean, like certain services need to run at a high peak, but then you don't run your best job. So that's the advantage of, of, of running things on Kubernetes, right? Yeah, the problem is predicting memory limits is quite easy for for Elasticsearch right. CPU mm -hmm. because you don't know how much is going to be. Yeah. But again, so just just from the trenches, so far we didn't have any issues with CPU, or at least not so many. No, but yeah, usually CPU. That may be on the same node. No, not even that. I mean, we, we we track the CPU usage on each host, obviously. So we see that that it's not overloaded. None of these hosts is overloaded on a CPU level yet. So I have to say yet, right? Yes. It might 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 <coughs> get Our happen. Utilization is not yet maximized, basically. Yeah. <laughs> if we're if right. we're looking at like maximizing the utilization of all of our nodes, then maybe we'll 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 need to make sure that we have enough buffer. But I think. But what, what's your practice on estimating CPU load and memory? For memory, you've got guidelines, but for CPU? As I said, so we basically just track the usage over time and, and, and set the limits accordingly. Yeah. So you basically start with either no limits at all, which is probably not the best way, but probably a very large limit to have enough buffer, buffer to see where it goes. 
And if you see that's too much, then you scale it down. If you see it's I'm hitting the peak, then you scale it up. Okay, uh, let's just continue. Maybe we can have a bit more discussion in the end. Uh, troubleshooting, just, just a couple of tips. So basically, Elasticsearch already tells you a lot about itself. Uh, there are these APIs, uh, CAT APIs and the cluster node APIs. Um, CAT APIs, their primary distinct factor is that they are human readable, so you can basically just use watch and watch the state of your cluster over time. Uh, it refreshes. Um, I think, okay, these are the parts now, uh, but yeah, if you see here, so you curl, uh, and I see my nodes, uh, I curl, I see my indices. Okay, there's only one index in this cluster, which is our example index. Uh, but it throws you the health status, so this one is green, it's fine. Uh, quite interesting one, and this one is also in quite interesting to watch. To watch. Uh, got shards. This gives you your shard allocation. And why is that important? Why is that interesting to watch? Because now if I... Uh, for the start, I'm just going to add one. I oh, know, I have four already, I think, so I have to kill it. Uh, so now I basically kill the node, right? Scale it down. Um, it's still running. <laughs> Hasn't recognized yet what's yeah. coming. It's still uh, so it's just watch. Q, cuddle, get nodes, and you have a one. Ah, no, pods, sorry. So this one, it's still there, right? So it's still keeping it steady. It's still happy, now yeah. it's, gone. it's gone. And now my shards go. Um, and what, now if I scale it back up, um, Elasticsearch would always try to utilize all the nodes. So if I scale it back up, it's actually going to reallocate. It's so it's, it's actually, okay, now it's, now what we're going to see is, um, this index is yellow. That's one side effect. So it says now somebody would get woken up at night because the cluster state went to yellow. No, I disabled that alert. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, it's it's probably going to take a minute or so to recover, uh, but it's going to recover because now it still has enough nodes to to rebalance. So it's going to take these indices and copy these shards and copy them over from the replicas. Uh, yeah. What's this oh. explain one that, that sh actually shows the migrations? Uh, yeah, you have this um, cut. I oh, know you see it actually went pretty fast uh, because this is a relatively small index. If you have a larger index of our product index, that takes a minute. So you would actually see the states that would go into recovery and. Uh, so you have this. One second. Uh, you have this. This. This is important once you're. Normally you don't have to look at that, but if you're on production and your production is down and you have to give a progress report, then you want to have a look at this thing. It gives you the status of your recovery jobs. What's uh, relocation? Relocation is what would happen if I bring that node back. So right now the cluster is green, right? Everything is fine. But if I fire up another node, another data node, it's going to start relocating some of these shards to that oh, new node. Okay. So there's, there's no need to do that because everything is fine, but it's going to relocate them anyway. This actually makes Elasticsearch so wonderful to run on Kubernetes, right? Right. Because it auto recovers everything. Right. So it's basically two levels of auto recovery, right? Kubernetes is going to bring your pod back at some point, and then Elasticsearch is going to recover by itself. That's why we disabled that alert, because Kubernetes is going to handle it for us. Um, yeah. Thread pool. I'm not going to show you that because it's a lot of data. Um, but you can also, all these, all these endpoints you can basically monitor in, in uh, Datadog. So uh, Datadog is using, is basically consuming these cluster and node APIs. Um, so they can you for, give you, for instance, your JVM usage uh, live. So you rarely have to actually SSH into your nodes to see what's going on. You get everything under. Um, come on, OK, I showed you that, right? Chart allocation. So this would be if you, if you query your node endpoint, you can go by node for each node or for all nodes, um, and you get your. There's actually a way to give you human readable output, but this one says okay, it's going to use. It's right now using one gigabyte of heap space, 
main all of it. A couple of things you can do dynamically. Um, we're not doing that a lot, but uh, if you're more concerned about downtime, there are a couple of things you can tweak before you restart nodes or stuff. Uh, for instance, you can dynamically adjust your master node, number of master nodes. You can dynamically, I guess, I don't know. You can set these things transient or persistent. Transient means it's going to reset to default on the next restart. I'm not sure that it even matters in Kubernetes because when we restart the pod, and it's supposed to be persistent, but the master pods are not persistent. So it's probably going to be transit anyway. Uh, cluster level shard allocation, this is something that's interesting if you, wanna, if you have a scheduled restart, right? If you restart that node immediately, the last restart is going to start recovering the indices. But if you know that node's going to come back up and it has a PVC attached to it, uh, you want to probably disable that allocation because it's going to waste a lot of resources. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, if you're short on resources, you want to or you don't want to affect other services running on the cluster. Um, could be done using lifecycle hooks or ham hooks. Uh, you can use shard allocation filtering, which is the Elasticsearch pendant to cordoning of nodes. It basically means, okay, I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna say no index, no shard should be on that particular node, and then it's gonna move all the indexes off that node. It's a way to do <coughs> that in a controlled manner, what I just did in the less nice way by just killing that node. Uh, we're not doing it, but yeah, if you feel sensitive about that, you can use that. A um, couple of other things which are more advanced we're not using them. I might want to look at that at some point. Um, shard allocation awareness. So you can basically set proprietary labels on your nodes, uh, and then you can tell Elasticsearch to take these labels into account when allocating shards. Uh, which is interesting if you, for instance, availability zones or racks. So you can, st you can schedule all these charts and nodes onto different hosts in Kubernetes, but then they might still be in the same AZ. So if you have a split cluster, if one AZ goes down, your Elasticsearch might still be down. And if you do this shard allocation awareness stuff, then you can avoid that. Again, we're not doing that yet. Um, yeah, the shard allocation filtering I just mentioned might be worthwhile looking into that at some point. One big pitfall we ran into, and this is something I want to mention, um, scripting, which is something that is disabled by default for good reason. Um, one of the reasons is a security thing. The scripts run with the same permissions as your Elasticsearch cluster, so careful with that. Um, if you want, if you need to do dynamic stuff in your queries, or not you, but your developers, if they come to you begging, please enable scripting. Try to convince them to use these sandbox scripts that are, yeah, mustache expressions. I honestly don't really know much about them. Uh, but if you really have to enable dynamic scripting, which is using Groovy, which is, if you haven't heard about that, kind of like a scripting language running on a JVM. Uh, it's a, it's a dynamically compiled scripting language, and this is the problem. It starts compiling these scripts every time you run a query with a script in it, with an embedded script in it, and that's going to fill up something called your bytecode cache in your JVM. And like, basically, what happened is we enabled that stuff without proper testing, and it didn't have any immediate impact. But after three days or something, our nodes started running out of memory and pretty, pretty bad out of memory. So it looked pretty much like this to us. Um, so everything went down and we, it took us a while to figure out what, what the problem was. Uh, to avoid that, what you want to do is using parameterized scripts. So what our developers basically did, they used string concatenation to put dynamic parts and static parts of the script into one string and sent that to the cluster, which let the cluster recompiling the scripts every time. Uh, but there is something like a pendant to parameterized queries and databases where you basically have placeholders that are get replaced at query time. And then it's compiling only once the parameterized script. <coughs> yeah, it's pretty much like parameterized SQL queries. Uh, yeah. I mean, well, yeah, all right. Um, and if you go for it, test the impact on your cluster, test your CPU usage, have a look at your memory usage. Make sure your cluster is not public. It's not, pub it's not public anyway, right? Uh, it better not be. Uh, don't run your Elasticsearch as root inside your pods. 
So it's just the user <coughs> due diligence. I'm surprised that the scripts cause an out of memory problem because they ate up memory. It's because because, the, the because of that memory cache. The, the way that the scripts were written basically explained that um, there were dynamic parts of the script that were. I mean, the the, the whole query was sent uh, as text each time. So you know, if you use a database, you can prepare you can yeah, prepare you statements, can right? Prepare statements. One one time compiled, and then you just pass in the parameters. Doesn't the JVM reclaim the memory after it's finished compiling? And I think that's that that there is also a bug in the JVM involved actually. So it's something right. that's in Java eight and in Java nine that's kind of mitigated. So there's a lot of we found a surprising lot of different factors that played into this. But what basically what basically happened it, it started compiling these scripts every time you send a query. So there is and you didn't release the memory. something. There's something called a script cache. Oh. It's it key, no, a compiled code cache, and it kept, and he kept it, it kept compiling until that cache was full. And once that cache was full, it compiled every script every time it got the query, and that started eating up the CPU and the memory. Oh. And at some point, the whole thing went down. Wow. I think this picture is a bit too soon. <laughs> yeah, it was. In our case, it was already done. That this was the cluster. So. <laughs> Okay, um, I want to mention this thing. Uh, we're not using it, but I suppose if we would start over, this is one of the things we would look at. Um, it's called Elasticsearch Operator, which basically gives you a controller which has a custom resource definition called Elasticsearch Cluster. So you can basically, uh, you can basically in your this is this thing. I hope this is readable. You can basically create a resource of type Elasticsearch cluster uh, and set custom properties for this type. So like you create a deployment or a stateful set, now you create an Elasticsearch cluster. And that is going to create all the other stuff, all the Elasticsearch, all the deployments and stateful sets and services and everything. Does everyone know what an operator is compared to a Helm chart or <coughs> anything else? Not for me. I guess you know. Um, so just a, a bit of background on that. A, the terminology operator is used in Kubernetes as a, it's a bit of custom code that embeds best practice around a particular bit of technology. So in the case of the Elasticsearch operator, it implements um, a bit of YAML that's familiar with a deployment or a pod or anything else that you're familiar with but it takes those things to be able to deploy Elasticsearch in the best possible way um, and combines them all together. So behind the scenes, it will go through and it will create um, event loops. It will watch to see if the pods are running, making sure that they're running healthy. Um, it will provide things like backups and snapshots, uh, attaching storage. And so you don't have to worry about if it's going to be a stateful set or if it's going to be a deployment. It will handle it all for you based on the team who's sort of the group of developers who are putting together this operator. So right. you see things like Elasticsearch, but there's other things for Kafka and um, Etc.D and a, a bunch of other tools out there. So it's sort of something that's been developed in the last year or two as a, as a way of adding a bit of intelligence around running a particular piece of technology. Right. So, so compared to Helm, it's uh, lighter weight, heavier weight, heavier weight. So Helm. I mean, it gives you it's, it gives you lighter weight Helm charts in the end because you don't have to. Yeah, so a, a Helm chart can wrap around an operator um, because at the end of the day, this is just passed to the Kubernetes API. The Kubernetes API will store it and then it'll pass it on to a bit of code. And so that bit of code, being the Elasticsearch operator, will then <coughs> operate on that, talk to the Kubernetes backend, um, and create all the <coughs> pods stateful sets and everything else based on best practice for you. So it's usually a, a, a controller itself. Um, in most of the cases, it's in Go, but it doesn't have to be. It can be in Python or, or anything else. It can talk to the Kubernetes API to build something that will um, give you a really optimal <coughs> experience for running these sorts of things. Yeah, so how much are the Elastic folks developing these themselves, these that's, Kubernetes that's components, the thing. or is it all third party? That's the thing they don't. Yeah, it's uh, all for the But I had a, there was, there was a, there was a talk on YouTube uh, where they discussed exactly that question. Um, so, so far they don't. It would be obviously, 
I think it's part of the concept behind operators that mm -hmm. the vendor creates the operator because it embeds the domain knowledge and who knows the domain better than the vendor. Uh, but yeah, so far they don't, so this thing is maintained basically by one person, which is also one reason for us not to use it because it's a bit of a gamble. And bank not to use it. It is open source, so you can fork it. Yeah, all right. From so an economic standpoint, uh, how does it compare with a hosted Elasticsearch deployment? Is it cheaper or more expensive? You definitely have more control because it's on your own cluster. But well, I mean, I, I did invest quite a bit of time in this thing recently, but then I'm also confident that this is almost closed. It was related to upgrading into Elasticsearch and the community is 1.7, so we added a lot of new concepts. Why did we not go for hosted? We considered hosted Elasticsearch, yes. We considered it. Uh, I think, I mean, one thing is there's a lack of, you can't, you can't run hosted AWS Elasticsearch in, in Singapore. You couldn't, I think. No, but we could, we could use, uh, we could use, like, you can Elastic use AWS, Cloud. but you could use the one from Elastic, Elastic Company then itself. Then or there are a lot, of, a lot of service providers for Elasticsearch. Right. But then there's not only a cost factor, there's also a bit of a, as I mentioned before, there's a governance factor involved. Like, right? you want to have your data in a third party uh, mm -hmm. location. Uh, there's latency, there's performance involved. I mean, it's probably for Elasticsearch, maybe not that defining criteria, <laughs> but for something like Kafka, it might be. I think Elasticsearch was the very first thing we ran on Kubernetes. It was a proof of concept that Kubernetes is, um, could handle it. Yeah. It was one of the things. Okay, just, just to wrap this up, so as, as Hunter said, um, it gives you a level of a higher level of abstraction over the Kubernetes primitives. It's, it embeds the domain knowledge, and it's in the best case, it comes from the vendor, so you get something that's actually sound and solid. Um, yeah, and if you want to see a demo of that thing, there's a video on YouTube. <laughs> I'm not going to show you that now you because see it in the prices. yeah. Um, but again, it's it's one. If you look at the current distribution chart on GitHub, it's one guy yeah. doing this. So yeah. Okay, that's it. There is 11 contributors, so it's not just one guy. It's not that much, right? You type right. those in the documentation. <laughs> Where is that? Where are these charts again? Insights. 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 No, I just click on contributors. Yeah, you see. It's, it's, it's one guy. <laughs> it's yeah, predominantly one person. One <coughs> Steve, six billion lines. So what happens? Is it? Let me guess. It's it's, it's all the Go vendors. <laughs> six million, million lines. It's a lot of lines, of course. He's, he's a very he's a very productive person. Okay, yeah, that's that's the end of my talk. Uh, I think we're running a bit late, and we should not discuss yeah, too much now. Thank you, uh, uh, Jörg, because now I don't have to talk a lot. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Actually.